I have titled tonight's little study, Authentic Healing in the Word of God. And you'll see why as we go through here. Um, I don't know if any of you know of, I know Mom and Peter do, uh, MacArthur and a bunch of other pastors got together recently and had a conference on the charismatic movement and what its implications are and have been for up to about 30 years now, uh, worldwide, not just within the United States. And uh, we're all familiar with uh, the, the big faith healers, the Benny Hens, uh, the Morris Cirillos, uh, people like that. There's a gentleman, a pastor, he's, he's a young pastor, he's in his, I think in his late 30s. Uh, he is up on charges. He has a gigantic mega church, charismatic mega church in Singapore, and he's up on charges for embezzling $40 million from his congregation so that he could promote his wife's hip-hop, sexy, bebop uh, radio and, and singing career. And the authorities stepped in, because it's embezzlement, and brought charges up on him and his congregation, the thousands and thousands and thousands of people that comprise his flock and his following, are in revolt and tell the authorities, you can't do that. He's getting exactly what we want. He promises that Christ has come to give us wealth and prosperity and, and a better life, and he's got it. Now, the fact that he's got it on their backs doesn't make any difference, but, he, but they, he's got it. Yeah. So, and they're, they're, they're completely and totally blind to it, and they're following him. Uh, one of the gentlemen, one of the pastors that preached at uh, Strange Fire, which was the conference for, at John MacArthur's church, his name is Conway uh, Mbewe is his name. He's from Africa. And his, his testimony over the last 30 years is that this charismatic apostles and prophets and healings and things like that is now really the face of Christianity throughout the entire continent, uh, the southern continent of uh, Africa. 90% of the quote evangelicals in Africa are, are this charismatic charismaniac, really, really extreme type people. Um, uh, in June, I was looking online because he mentioned that there was uh, articles in the paper. This is a common occurrence, by the way. In June, there was a newspaper ad out of uh, Zambia, one of the countries in the southern section of uh, Africa. One prophet, very well-known prophet, and uh, another uh, preacher uh, were brought up on charges of rape, and what they do is is they they basically tell these people you need a breakthrough, you need some, you have some spiritual garbage between you and God, and you need someone with greater power, greater spiritual intuitiveness and connectivity to God to break through all that spiritual garbage and so that your prayers can be heard by God because God can't hear you. But I'm here and I will be the mediator between you and I'll get there because I'm the, the man of God, quote unquote. They, that's their term. Um, Conrad, this, this pastor, Pastor Conrad, says they're nothing more than the village witch doctor. They do the same thing. And it's about them. And they're the ones with the power. And so what they'll do is every weekend, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people will escape into the hills, into the fields where these great prophets and apostles are, are doing their deliverance and their breakthroughs and their special all-night prayer meetings. It's a every weekend kind of thing. Thousands of them go. And what they'll do is, is uh, women will come to them and say, you know, I have problems. Uh, one that I read was she was having problems with her uh, uh, womanly cycle, her menstrual cycle. So she goes to this particular prophet and he says, well, we're having a faith healing, a prayer thing up here in, in the cornfields, in the field. So 
meat is there. Bring a chicken, bring, put a little bit of the chicken's blood in, in a jar and mix it with water and, and, and bring it with us and, and bring some of your clothes and, and meet us there and we'll be there. So they got there and they took the water with a little bit of chicken blood, they poured it on top of her out in this field and then proceeded to assault her physically. And that was the way that this breakthrough was going to take place. And they won't say anything. The victims won't say anything. Usually, hundreds of people will be molested and they will say nothing. Because this man of God's the one with the power. And if he does, if you do anything, bring any charge against this guy, then the man of power not only has the ability to bless, but he also has the ability to curse. And so the fear is, if we say anything, then we're not going to, we're, he's going to get cursed. He's going to curse us. So that is what he says is now the most prevalent face of Christianity in all of Africa. All of the southern half. Northern half is more Islamic. Bottom half, south of the Sierra Desert, is this evangelicalism kind of charismatic craziness. Now he didn't say this, he said it more of a joke, but that came from America. That whole movement really had its origins in the first part of the 1900s in America. And we exported it. Now that doesn't mean that all those people are nutters. They're not all crazy. They're not all on the fringe, but it does bring up the question, how do we know what is authentic? <coughs> yes? I've been hearing a commercial on a local station where, you know, I listened to, during the day, Tom Sullivan, Rush Limbaugh, uh, Sacramento station, and they have regular commercials for this ex-pastor who has found the secret in the Bible on how to be rich and to oh, call, yeah. call, call and find out what, what secret in the Bible has helped him turn a thousand dollars into three hundred thousand or something anyway uh, it's it's a sign of the time, as far as I'm concerned. I have never, I, I could never imagine something like that, anybody getting away with spreading that kind of false doctrine and not everybody all over it saying, you're a fraud, you're, you know, well, get here, out of here. That's a very good point, and, I, and, and it brings up my next point, and it's the one that, that Pastor Conrad mentioned, because he's, he's preaching to American pastors evangelical American pastors. And his comment is, is uh, why are you so quiet? Why do you allow this to go on? Do you not, and, and I'm thinking in the back of my head, well, it's not really that big of a deal, is it? I mean, that's really, those, are, those really are the fringe type people. But when he started talking about how this was now the face of Christianity in Africa, well, Africa is like one of the most potentially powerful up-and-coming developing countries. That's, that's where your next missionary branch is going to explode out of, is out of, out, of, out of Africa. And it's not only in Africa. We have friends that are in Germany right now, uh, pastors. We have uh, friends who are leaders in the church who have now left the church, left their traditional church, and now they're heading up these big, uh, they're following these African apostolic people. Where did that one guy come from? That's, don't know, but it's, just, it's, it's, it's now, it's spreading. And I'm hearing more and more and more of it. I mean, we have family in Europe and they're, they're letting us know it's becoming a big deal. It's, it's almost like taking over. Here's, here's a, a, a faint quote for you. Mormonism? Mormons, 14 million in the world. Those who follow the, the faith 
kind of healing, charismatic kind of stuff? 500 million. Gives you a little bit of an idea of, of you know, where, where is this? Now, and the, but the question again comes back, well, what, why is there such a big deal with that? Here's the big deal. Because if the man of God becomes the source of knowledge and revelation from God, if he becomes the source of power through which you have healing and all these great miracles taking place, then why do you need God and why do you need the Bible? As a matter of fact, what we're finding out is, according to Pastor Conrad and the other people that were there at this conference, you don't. The Bible gets closed and set aside. You won't hear much more than little platitudes, little quotes here, little quotes that are twisted out of context and used, but that's all you're going to get. So, after listening to some of this, and I'm getting to tonight's lesson. <laughs> it, is, it just seemed to mesh. And I, and I want to take a look at this, this because I think Jesus and the Holy Spirit in his word reveal what really is authentic healing and what priority, what place and purpose does it have. Because obviously Jesus did heal. The apostles healed. Jesus raised the dead, right? So it's not that, we, that it doesn't happen or that it hasn't happened. The question is, is why did it happen and what place did, and what role did it play? And where did it fit with God's word and the preaching and teaching of God's word? Okay? So that's what, that's what I want to look at a little bit tonight. So we're going to be in Mark tonight, chapter 1. Starting in verse 29. The parallel that we're going to be flipping between is this one and Luke chapter 4. Now, I don't know about you, but... Chapter 1, I believe you said. Yes. Yeah. What I've done is I just use a big paper clip so that I can just go back and forth like this. There you go. <laughs> so, Mark chapter 1, we're going to read uh, verse, uh, verses 29 through... 39. So we got 10 verses in Mark. The parallel, I said, is in chapter 4 of Luke. That's verses 38 through 44. And we'll, we'll be bouncing back and forth, but our focus will be in Mark. So Mark chapter 1, verse 29. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. And Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Okay, that's where we're going to be tonight. What's the setting? It's verse 29. We're going to just you know, work through this way through it, just systematically verse by verse. We're going to go through it. Verse 29, what is the setting? Synagogue. Left the synagogue. Yeah. What synagogue? In Galilee. It's in Galilee. What city in Galilee? Yeah. Capernaum. Yeah. Capernaum, yes. Remember in, in Luke, we just, he, the, the one we did last, last week was he was in the synagogue and he was preaching in Capernaum and the demon-possessed the demon -possessed man shouted out and he cast out the demon-possessed man and he's, he's still in the... Told him to be quiet. Yeah, told, him to, told the demon to be quiet and um, told him to be quiet, cast him out and then uh, he continue, finished his, his uh, sermon. 
Um, so if you were to look at Luke verse, uh, chapter 4 uh, in verse 36, it says, All the people were amazed and said to each other, What is this teaching? With authority and power he gives orders to evil spirits and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Okay, so go back to Mark. So he's left the synagogue. It's on the Sabbath, by the way. This is a Sabbath. We, f we read that in verse 21 of, cha of chapter 1 of Mark. He's in Capernaum, and on the Sabbath he goes to the synagogue. Okay, so it's a synagogue. He's finished preaching, and they're ready to leave. This puts it at about noon, because according to tradition, morning services, morning Sabbath, would last until about noon, and then it would be finished. And then they would all go for a big supper at whatever, whoever's house the, the rabbi has been invited to. Now, who invites, the, who invites this rabbi? Who invites Jesus? Simon. Simon. Simon invites. Who goes with Simon? Andrew is one. Andrew is Simon's brother. Who else? Verse 29. James and John. Thank you very much. Yes, James and John. James and John, uh, we find out, are companions, friends with Simon and Andrew. Okay? Keep in mind, although Jesus has spoken to them and, and called them to a certain degree, it's still not a band yet. It's still not the twelve yet. So they're still a bit on the fringe. They haven't really been commissioned all the way yet. And not all the disciples are there yet. Matthew's not there yet. So Simon and Andrew invite Jesus to Simon's house. Simon's Peter, by the way, if you don't know that. Uh, why? Why, do, why? Why does Simon and Andrew want Jesus to come to his house. His sick mother-in-law. He has a sick mother-in-law. What kind of sickness does she have? Fever. She has a fever. Luke expresses it as a sort of like a super high fever, a mega type of fever. Okay. And they, if you look in verse thirty, uh, says Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. And they told Jesus about her. Luke says they asked Jesus to help her. Okay? He's, he's just cast out this demon. He has already the reputation for healing because we, we read that before. He already healed somebody in Capernaum. He wasn't even there when he did it. He just said, your, your son's healed. Right? Okay? So Simon Peter and Andrew take Jesus to their house for the big you know, Sunday supper, not Sunday, it's the Sabbath, Sabbath, Sabbath meal. So they get there, and they go there primarily because mother-in-law is sick. Uh, well, does that mean that Peter was married? Mm -hmm. Shake your head, yes. Yes, that's right, that's right. I'm sorry for all of our Catholic friends, no, it is cel celibacy was, is not a thing that went all the way back to, to Peter. That's not, that's not where, it, where it goes. Priests do not have to remain celibate. I don't know where they get that. Peter was married. Had a mother-in-law. She's sick. So, what happened in 31? So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. So tell me a little bit about this healing. What are some characteristics of it? If you had to describe it, use some adjectives and adverbs and stuff. Give me some descriptives for this particular healing. Yes, sir? Instant. Instant. Instantaneous. Mm -hmm. did, he, did he pronounce a healing and then it took her a little while to recuperate? No. 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 He not took her hand. No, not a lot of hoopla. Not, it wasn't fancy. It wasn't it wasn't a dun, da, 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 type of thing. It was no, no grand, chanting. yeah, no sparks of lights, no lightning, no grand chanting, just grabbed her hand and picked her up and went away. Now, Luke does add a little, little bit there. Uh, Luke says, so he bent over her and rebuked the fever and it left her. And he got, she got up at once 
and began to wait on them. So he, he bends over, grabs her hand, rebukes the fever, says, go away, it goes, she pull, <laughs> helps her up, and she goes about her business doing what? What would a mother-in-law do on a Sabbath meal afternoon? She'd want to serve if she was up to it. Of she course. Want to be the of course. She goes out, she starts serving. The hostess. Instantaneous. It is complete. There's no, oh, well, uh, now that I've done my part, now you've got to take a couple aspirin for a while. You know. No, she got up immediately and immediately served. Now, that, that's, that's, that's pretty, uh, to me, that's pretty, that, that says a lot. There's a lot to be said about instantaneous, total, comprehensive healing. Boom. Done. Get up. There wasn't a lot of coaxing the sickness. That right, exactly. Yeah. Verse 32. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. What is significant about that evening after sunset? So many people brought sick people to him. Now, why would they bring them after sunset? Because Sabbath is over. Now they... That's right. Sabbath finished at 6 o'clock p.m. <clears throat> They had their meal, you know, the, the, the sermon in the synagogue finishes about 12 o'clock. They go, he, he's, he's cast out a demon. He goes to Simon and Andrew's house and heals uh, Simon's mother-in-law. They have their meal and their time together. Now the Sabbath is over and people could literally pick up their sick people and carry them the distance to Simon's house. Where did they bring all of these people? What did it say? A couple people in town? R verse 33? The whole, the, whole the, the whole town gathered at Simon Peter's door. Now, now imagine this. This is Capernaum. This is not a little rinky-dink town. This is a big town. This is several thousand. Probably a couple tens of thousands of people would probably live in there. And, they, and, and this idea, now literally not every single person is at, his, at the door, but the idea meaning is that there's a massive number of people who are now free by the law. It's no longer the Sabbath. They can now work, pick up things. Remember how they said, they accused Jesus of, you know, you, they making that man break the law because you told him to pick up his mat. Yeah. Right? So now they're carrying their, the people, they're bringing their people, helping them get there to... Jesus is, where Jesus is at Simon's house. Um, how many did he heal? Many. This one says many. Flip it over to uh, Luke chapter 4. Keep your finger in Mark because we're going to go back there. But look at Luke chapter 4 in verse 40. Someone read verse 40 for me, please. When the sun was setting, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Very good. So how many people did Jesus heal? All. So let me, let me, let me, let's go back to that descriptive. Let's go back to those descriptives of healing, divine healing. It is instantaneous. It is totally comprehensive. It completes the entire thing. There's nothing left to recuperate. Mm -hmm. And three, it's indiscriminate. Mm -hmm. it's doesn't, it doesn't discriminate against the type of disease. It doesn't discriminate on the person coming. It doesn't discriminate on the time of day. It doesn't depend on whether Jesus is fed or unfed or had energy, no energy, whatever. It just... They brought them all who were sick and demon-possessed. And they brought him, and he touched them, and instantly they were healed completely and totally. Yes, sir? 
I have a question. Yes, sir. Is demon possession a sickness? I don't believe that it would be labeled as a sickness. We talked a little bit about uh, two weeks ago about uh, Jesus in his sermon out of uh, Isaiah 61, uh, out of Luke. He says, uh, out of Isaiah 61, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners to recover the, and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And we talked about what do those things mean. And one of them that we looked at was that the God of this world blinds mm -hmm. and oppresses and keep people in prison. Sin keeps people in prison. So Luke, we, we said, uh, brings this up and then pairs it with Jesus' sermon and the, the delivering of the demon-possessed man to prove and show that not only did he proclaim that he had the power that he was the one God sent, but that also he had the power of absolutely doing it and freeing them who are oppressed and prisoners and blind from the power of sin as well as from the power of the demon. So I don't know that it would be separate. Uh, well, that would be the one and the same. I believe they're separate. No, but you have another, yeah. another question. You, go ahead. No, it's in Luke, it, it says that he healed them uh, from various kinds of sickness, laying ha his hands on each one. Uh, and then moreover, mm -hmm. demons came out of many people. So it's like different thing. Right. He, you know, healed uh, physically. Who was excluded from Jesus' healing power? And what disease was not immediately healed? <clears throat> Were there, were there any that, that walked away discouraged, going, oh, man, no. this didn't work? It didn't work on me, yeah. No, it didn't. It worked on everybody. I mean, Jesus had authority. How many, how many of them required faith on their own? <laughs> this, is a, this is a very big question. Even in non- uh, charismatic circles, the question of can does God have the authority, does God heal, if the recipient of the healing or the recipient of the answer does not have faith themselves. In fact, this came up in a Bible study not long ago. Yeah, it seems like, the, well, they came. <laughs> yes, they did well, come, but here, here's, a, here's the comment that I'm going to use that you made. You make this several times. You bring this up uh, uh, again and again. Is that people came not because they believed in Jesus, but because they believed that he could heal them. They were amazed at his miracles and his power, but they didn't necessarily believe in him and who he said he was. Right. They didn't right. have faith. They were amazed, but didn't have faith. Right. That's so, what? Uh, but there is, a, there is a scripture in which Jesus said that, there, the, because there was no faith in the town, he could not continue doing miracles and he left. That was also in the Bible. So I think a lot of times people put those two together and they say, okay, well, because there was no faith there, he had to leave. He, 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 was, he was limited. His hands were in handcuffs. God could not do something in that town because the faith was not there. And I think that's a bad interpretation. That's, that's, that's misleading. It's throwing away everything else in Scripture in order to hang on to that one. Do you see what I mean? Kind of. Jesus did not need... And, and the question came, well, what if they, what if they were in a coma? Yeah. Did the, did the demon-possessed Did the demon possessed people come in faith? No. 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 That was so at, at what... What, what point does God say, I will limit what I will do. I choose to limit what I will do because of lack of faith, because you're rejecting me. And I'm going to intervene anyway. Yes, sir. Okay, th those people, the demon possessed, and they came to Jesus, right? Some did. Okay, what about the ones that didn't come to him? Did they get demons cast out of them? Well, yeah, the man in the synagogue didn't come to see Jesus, so to yeah, speak. He was in the, in the what, synagogue. What town, are, what town are we in here? Capernaum. 
Supposing there's some more people in Capernaum that are mm -hmm. demon possessed, right? And they didn't come to Jesus. They didn't get didn't get the demons cast out, right? No, I assume not. Because the Bible doesn't the say they did. The man uh, where the Lord cast the demons into the pigs, <clears throat> into the swine. Did the man come and say, please get rid of these demons in me? No, they came because they saw who he was, who Jesus was. They came screaming. So did the man in the synagogue. They came screaming. So it's, it's and I'll, I'll, let me ask, I was going to say this towards the end, but I'm going to ask this now. Of all the healings, all the miraculous miracles that Jesus did during his three some odd years that he was walking the earth, how many people ran up to him and said, Oh Lord, I am a horrible sinner. Please save me from my sin. Please cure me. Heal my, my flesh, my hard, stony heart. That's why they came to Jesus. They came to Jesus because they knew they were sinners. They knew they had broken God's law. That's why they were swarming to Peter's door. No, no they knew because he was the only way they get healed. Yes, exactly. That's, that's right. So when they had some faith, they believed in him some, to some point, but I believe it's in John. Doesn't John say that Jesus, that, that, that these people believed in him, in his name, in who he was, his power, whatever? But Jesus knew their hearts, and so he didn't commit himself to them. So they believed in something. They believed he, had, he, was, the, he was the magic. He was the power source. He was the cure. But they didn't believe in him. They didn't believe in him. And this is going to become important as we go on further. Verse 34, he drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Uh, Luke, uh, as uh, mom uh, read, says in verse 41 of Luke, Moreover, demons came out of many people, shouting, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Christ. Now, why did Jesus command them to be silent? He, he doesn't want uh, demons witnessing of his glory. He doesn't need their backing. Wow, that was fast. Good job. <laughs> that That's would, good. That would be insulting. That would be like Al Capone swearing that you are a real honest person. Well, <laughs> that, that doesn't. That isn't. It, a they don't fit, do they? It, it creates confusion, testimony. doesn't it? Right. Yes. Uh, someone go to Acts. Someone find Acts chapter sixteen. Go to Acts chapter 16. And someone, please read verses 16 through 19. Acts chapter 16, verses 16 through 19. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us shouting. How far do you want me to read? Through 19, please. These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. Okay. So here's Paul, Paul and Silas. They're in Philippi. And they are going around doing their evangelical missionary work. Spreading the gospel, spreading the news, telling people about Jesus. And they meet this girl who has a spirit. Now, the, the Greek is uh, a python spirit or spirit of python. Python in the Greek was the guardian of the oracle of Delphi. The, the, he was, he was uh, like Greek mythology. And 
Yeah, and he was was a creature of Hera, Zeus's wife. And I'm not going to go into too much detail, but basically what they were saying was is that this girl spoke from the oracle at Delphi, that the spirit that guarded the prophets, the oracle, this great speaking stone, whatever it was, I think it was supposed to be like the belly button of the earth or some ridiculous thing like that. But this was what they associated with her. That's how she has a, she has a spirit of divination being able to foretell futures and prophesy. And she's running around, walking around with Paul and Silas, screaming, this is the man, these are men of God, the most high God, who's telling you how to be saved. And she, everywhere he, they went, he, she just kept following, following, giving this testimony, giving this testimony. Why was that, why was it so troubling to Paul? That's what exactly mom said. Exactly what mom said. Why would you have a demon-possessed woman, a woman who had a spirit of divination as your spokesperson, as your John the Baptist, so to speak? Listen to these guys. They got it. They got it. Everybody knows who she is. They know what she's got. Now, Paul and Silas and their message is being confirmed by a pagan, demonic a spirit. What what do the two have to do with one another? Anything? No, there's light and darkness. There. Exactly. There's light and darkness. What does light have to do with darkness? There is nothing. So he turns. He's, he's troubled. I do not want you, unclean, filthy spirit, to to be proclaiming a witness for a holy God. That's creating confusion because you're bad, you're wicked, you're, you're lost, you're, you're condemned, you're fallen. I'm not going to have you speak for the Lord. So Paul turns and casts the demon out, commands the demon to come out, and it does. Jesus does basically the same thing. He doesn't want demonic people, demonic spirits, witnessing, testifying, giving proof that he is the God, that he is the Son of God. That is confusion. So he tells them to sh shut up, be quiet, be silent. Mm -hmm. Go back to Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. What is significant about that? What do you think is happening? Why is that there? What do you think? Jesus was taking care of those people at the front door that were jammed to his front door from all over the place, the whole town. And about it was finished about 9 o'clock and got to bed early and was able to take a nice evening's rest. And he just got up early in the morning and went out to pray. Is that how you read that? How do you read that? Seemed to me he wanted to be alone with God. With his father in heaven. Well, you, after, after sunset, peep, in verse 32, after sunset, people are crowding the front door to be healed. And then in verse 35, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to, to a solitary place and prayed. <coughs> what do you think happened between sunset and early in the morning before the, while it was still dark? What happened during that time? He healed, he, he healed, drove out demons. I don't know what, what you mean, unless maybe he got a little bit of sleep. I don't think, I think the indication is that he didn't get any sleep. That it went on until very early in the morning. And I'll tell you why. It ha takes place in the next couple verses. In fact, yeah, the next couple verses. But look at verse 36 and 37. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Yeah. War him out. Well, I don't know about war him out, but definitely he's, he's been busy. This has not been one of those, okay, we're just going to have a couple hours of prayer, and then it's all over. I think he, he's been 
working all day, all night, healing and demonstrating his power. And it has been consistent. There's nobody, you know, that is not a, he's not a battery that loses a charge. <coughs> he keeps going and going and going and going and going and going and going. And if they brought more, he brought them. And as soon as he touched them, they were healed completely, totally. But he absolutely. was man. And yes, he, he was. did need food and rest. Yes, but. he did. He did need food. He did need rest. And this particular time, it's early in the morning, it's still dark outside, and he leaves the house and he finds a solitary, the, another translation says lonely, just some place where he's alone, away, and he pr to pray, and he goes to pray. But Simon and, uh, or Peter and his buddies, they're, they're, not, they're not finished. They've been hosting the greatest, most miraculous night in all of his, Israel's history. This is, this is awesome, where'd he go? Let's go get him and bring him back. <laughs> Everybody wants. There's more people. Uh, again, I, I, I have to ask, who was excluded? Who walked away unsatisfied? Who walked away unhealed? No, no one. No one. Yet we have people all the time. And the faith healing and all these big conferences, you know, you come down the aisle and you, you know, get smacked in the head and you get laid out and you wiggle a little bit and maybe you grunt and, and all of a sudden it's all great and you get back up and you're ready to go again. <laughs> and that's, 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 that's considered, you know, the power of God moving. And if it doesn't happen, it's not the, it's not the man of God's fault. It's their fault for not having enough faith. Mm. Isn't that convenient? The product that you're giving money to, you're buying this product, it, the fact that it doesn't work is not the producers, the manufacturers of the product, it's because you don't know how to turn it on. You're at fault. And so you walk away feeling even more dejected, wondering if God perhaps doesn't love you or perhaps there's something greater wrong with you. God can't touch your life. That's, that's wicked. That is wickedness. Anyway, so what's Jesus' reply? Let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. Correct. Luke's version is in verse 42 through 43, and he says, or he writes, at daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving or leaving them. But he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because, what that, because that is why I was sent. Do you see that? Yes. Does that seem cold to you? That wasn't his main message. It, he, had a, he had a calling that included healing, but he had to preach about the kingdom of God. Right. Remember back in Luke when we looked at his preaching, his first sermon from Isaiah 61? Mm -hmm. what, was, uh, what was his, what was that first part? Remember that first part? It's in verse 18 of chapter 4 of Luke. It says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. That was the overarching commission. That was the, the umbrella. Under that umbrella came the freeing of the prisoners and the recovery of sight of the blind and the release of the oppressed. But the overarching message was, I've come to preach. I have to tell you. I have to preach. I have to preach. I have to tell you. And so he did. That was his, his business. And look in verse 39 of Mark. Uh, Mark chapter 1. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Well, there must have been a lot of demons in those days. Well, I'm glad you said that because, you know, there must have been a lot of demons in that day. Um, if, there's a couple things that I want to bring to your attention. The, the, as far as the, the, the study of this specifically, 
That's, that's all I want to do. I don't want to go any farther than that. But I want to bring some things to your attention if you don't know yet, okay? And that has to do partly with what you talked about, about demons, all right? Demon possession and the casting out of demons doesn't show up in biblical history until Christ. Does that surprise you? I know you're going, you're going through your head, right? You're going through, well, look, there was, there was that, that, that witch that, that called the spirit for, for, for Saul. There was the spirit that, that tormented Saul. I remember, but where, where is there any other, did anybody, did any prophet cast out a demon? No. We don't even, we don't even really hear a lot about evil spirits or Satan and things of that sort much in the 4,000 years, 3,000, 2,000, no, more than that, two, three, four, almost 4,000 years of Old Testament history. We don't have, we don't hear That's much of anything. Of Eden. That's it, we saw the serpent. Yeah. That's about it. In all that time, all those holy men, Moses, David, you don't hear anything about that. Christ shows up. Christ is born. Boy, they're all over the place, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Now, think future now from Christ. <laughs> think after Acts. Romans, mention of demonic possession, casting out demons. Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, mm -hmm. Galatians, Ephesians, mm -hmm. Philippians. We had someone cast out a demon in Philippi. Mm -hmm. You think maybe they might wrote, have written something about that if, if demons were really, really a big issue at that time in that area? I mean, that one lady was there. They cast out Paul. No. Titus. Oh, 1st and 2nd Timothy, the, 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 the pastoral writings definitely will have some church leaders need to know about casting out demons. Mm -hmm. No, we don't have that there either. Hmm. What do we have in those? What is, what is, the, what is the big command Preach Paul gives Timothy? What was that? Preach God's word. Preach the word. Hold on to the truth. Preach the word. In season and out. That's what you get in the epistle. Well, wait a minute. Why are there so many demons cast out in Jesus' time? Because his wor word was preached from himself. <laughs> he was the word, and the word had power. Doesn't that power. seem odd? That now, I'll get, I'll get, now before you before we go in, 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 in go a little bit further, let me go one more. Let's talk about healing, divine healing. All right, let's talk about divine healing for a moment. Where's my pen? <laughs> From the time of Adam to the time of Abraham, you have about 2,200 years plus or minus. How many healings? <clears throat> divine healings. Not necessarily a prophet has to do it, but it's a divine healing. Uh, well, if you think about... Uh, no, I thought about... One. Good. It's in Genesis chapter 20. <laughs> yeah, Abraham did, you know, give, one. give birth to uh, Sarah. No, 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 that, that was not, that was not listed as a healing. I'm talking, a, so there was an illness, and there's a healing. Specifically, it says, God intervened and healed. Some of that effect. There's one, it's in chapter 20. Remember when Abraham goes off and his, he's afraid that the king is going to yeah. seduce his wife and kill him for Sarah? So he says, Sarah, Sarah, Sarah. Just tell him you're my sister. Yeah. Right? What happens to the king and all of his people? They were sick. They, they were became sick. Them. They became all barren. They couldn't have it. No one could have children. And until they gave it back and made retribution back to Abraham and to Sarah, then it says in chapter 20, and God healed them and let them have children again. Mm -hmm. That's the first mention of healing, the real true healing, healing in, the, in, the, in, the, in 2,200 years. Now, from Abraham to Isaiah. We get a couple more in, the, in that time frame. That's another 1,500 years. That Elijah, when, when There's was one. Elijah? Yeah, 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 yeah. Very good, very good. You got Elijah. You got Elijah. Elijah raised the dead. Remember the son, the the son of the widow from Zarephath? Mm -hmm. He raised, he, there's the raising of the dead. That's a miracle. That's a good divine intervention. 
Uh, what about Elisha and, and Naaman? Yes, the Gentile man who had, that was a leper. Although he didn't, he didn't necessarily, you know, he didn't lay hands on him. He just, he just told him what to do and God healed him of his leprosy. So that's another one. In, in this 1500 year period, you have about 20. About, right around there. So between Adam and Isaiah, oh, we gotta do another one. There's another period that's Isaiah until time of Christ. That's 750 years. There aren't any. There are no recorded mentions of healing at all during that time. So, you're looking at, what, 4,000 some odd years? 4,000 some odd years, you have about 21 or so healings. Divine healings. How many do you think Christ did in just that one visit to Capernaum? Do you think maybe he beat 21? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and it took place again and again. All, remember he sent out the 70 and they were able to cast out demons and they were able to heal the sick. Remember that? He gave them the power to do that, the 70 they sent out. Mm -hmm. The apostles, even after Jesus went to heaven, ascended, they continued. Peter and John walked by, see the, the, was it paralytic? The, par, the paralytic man? The crippled man? Mm -hmm. And he's, you know, alms, alms for the poor, whatever, you know, give me, do you have any money? And, and Peter and John says, you know, money I, have, I don't have, but what I do have, I freely give. Stand up and walk. Mm -hmm. And heals a paralytic. This is not, okay, uh, there, I, I, there's somebody who's, whose leg length was a little bit off, and, you know, the, the man of God, faith healer, came up, oh, and all of a sudden, pull. <gasps> yay, I'm healed. Same leg length. No, 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 no. This was, he's paralyzed. He's been paralyzed his whole life. He's been blind his whole life. He's been deaf his whole life. He has no legs. He has new legs. He's dead. Now he's not. There's none of this, you know, you know oh, get, rid your, get rid of your headache. Yes, he got rid of a fever, but his norm was not getting rid of fevers. It was, this was a serious illness, serious infection. No question oh, about it. There was no, yes, exactly. Thank you. There's no question about it. So that takes place there. Now, what happens shortly after that early stage of the apostolic ministry? How many miracles do we read in of healing in Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, James, 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John. Do we, feel, do we see a lot of that in there? Yeah. I'll tell you what you do see. <clears throat> Larry finds Second Timothy, Chapter Four. Larissa, can you find F uh, Philippians Chapter Two? Esther. Can you do me a favor? Can you find 1 Timothy chapter 5? So Timothy, two types of Timothy there in the later years of Paul's ministry. Phile uh, Philippians is uh, during the life of Paul, but you know, significantly after Christ has risen. Uh, Larry, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20 says what? Aristus said, Aristus said in Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. uh, let, me, uh, let me apologize and ask your forgiveness for giving oh, you names like that. <laughs> sorry. It's okay. It's uh, uh, Trophimus. Or Trophimus. Trophimus. Trophimus is probably how it's pronounced. Trophimus. Trophimus was a helper of Paul. He went with Paul. He leaves him in Miletus in good health, healed, no. 
Sick. Sick. Oh, wait a minute. Where's all those faith healers? Why don't they just swarm all over him, lay their hands on him, and heal him? Why is Paul, the apostle, leaving him sick? Seems odd. Uh, Larissa, what is Philippians chapter 2, verse 26 and 27 say? because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died, but God had mercy on him, and uh, not on him only, but also on, on me, to share me sorrow upon sorrow. To spare to me. Spare yes, me that's Epaphroditus. That was another man who worked and ministered with Paul. He ends up getting so sick, he nearly dies. And then uh, Esther, 1 Timothy 5, verse 23. Stop drinking only water, but drink a little wine to help your stomach and your frequent sicknesses. That's Paul speaking to Timothy. <clears throat> Apparently... There's something in the water that was making him sick. So he says, stop drinking the water only. Have a little bit of wine with it. It'll help your stomach problem and it'll help, your, help stop your frequent illnesses. Where's the word of faith? Why didn't Timothy, the disciple, the, the son of faith, son and faith of Paul, just rebuke it and send it away? What happened to the swarms, the thousands that were pouring in to Simon's door and all were healed. Every last one of them here, there was not a discrepancy. No one walked away going, oh man, it, I did, it didn't work. Not one. Not one. What happened? Maybe it's not important enough. That's why it's not in the Bible. It's not that it didn't happen. It still happened with, with hundreds and hundreds of thousands and thousands of people getting healed all the time, every time, all the time, without discrepancy, without condition. It was just the man of God touched and it was done. Man of God rebuked, it was done. We're living now in an age where faith is required. And we're not to seek for signs, are we? Is it, is, it that, is it just a different age? Is it that we're not supposed to seek signs? Is it because we're living... They didn't require faith? The men of God definitely required faith. They had to have faith in order to perform these things. But what happened, what appears to have happened over the course of... You're talking 2,000 years since that time, 4,000 years before... Over 6,000 some odd years of biblical recorded history or you know thereabouts what seems to have happened what was it was it there was an insertion of, of miracles in Christ's ministry and his followers why why was that necessary here it goes back to what is the purpose for the healings and the miracles and the demons being around and be, what happened in that Time. What was significant? Never happened before. Doesn't happen, happen afterwards. It's only in that time something happened that sparked all of this miraculous explosion of healing and this explosion of demonic presence where people knew demons were there. God with us? Yes. Yes. Christ stepped foot on this earth. God became flesh. God with us. What did every demon say? This is the Son this of God. Is, yes, every last one. They couldn't help it. They knew who God was. They knew and still know to this day. When, when Jesus preached, we talked about this last time, when Jesus preached, the people knew fallen sinful man knew that there was something in his in his preaching wow this was he preaches with authority nobody has ever preached like this not the rabbis not the not the this is 
something awesome. Well, what was awesome? It was the Word of God preaching the Word of God. That's what made it so awesome. Of course there was something different about Jesus' preaching. Nobody can preach like Jesus. He was the Word in the flesh. Do you think demons still uh, pester and, and uh, uh, dwell in humans today? It's just that there are no apostles, no disciples here uh, of Jesus' time? Or do you think that perhaps the Lord kind of locked them up or something? I don't think that they locked them up. I don't know of anything in Scripture that says they were locked up yet. I know they're going to be. There's I know that there are some who have been locked up and will be released. But Satan still roams around like a roaring lion, says Peter. There's nothing to fear. There's just, there is nothing to fear. I mean, they have nothing it was, to it fear. It wasn't exposed before Jesus and after he was gone. There's, there's nothing for them to fear here on earth anymore. Well, what do you think they feared when God showed up on earth? In the flesh. What do you think they fear? We talked about this. You're going to remove me. You're taking. You're, you're going to destroy us. Yes. Our time is come. It's now, right? You've yeah. come to judge us now. It's time for us to be locked up now, right? Yeah. Jesus. Jesus goes to the goes back to the Father, and the church now is born. It's been two thousand years. You think they're they're still thinking that was the time? I don't think so. They've gone in hiding again. Where do they pop up? Where do you see it? If we're, if, if we're following what I think Luke is, told, is telling us and what I think Mark is telling us. They knew the Word of God preached by the Word of God. They knew God on earth. They also knew Paul. Jesus I know. Paul I know, but who are you? Remember that? Mm -hmm. Seven Sons of Sceva, Acts, mm -hmm. right? So the question remains is what did what was made Paul unique? Yes, he was called and he was an apostle. Jesus, we know why. Peter, same type of thing. But as time went on, what what do you think has happened to the Word of God? Do you think it's gotten the preaching of the Word of God? Let me put it that way. The preaching of the Word of God. Do we still have fiery disciples everywhere preaching the Word of God as, as pure and right on the money, spirit-filled, right from the mouth of God type of thing, open? Do you think that, that that's what's going on now? No. I don't think so either. I think it happens at times and in certain places. I think the Spirit just grabs hold of the person who's speaking the Word and the person is... is uh, has integrity to God's word, is preaching God's word, not an agenda, not some other idea, not a philosophy, not great wisdoms of something. He's just preaching God's word. And as he's preaching God's word and he's preaching it pure and he's pointing to Christ and who Christ is and what is going on and that the gospel that Jesus preached, that he has come to, to announce and proclaim the gospel the good news to the poor, to free the prisoners, to give blind, uh, or give blind people sight again, to release the oppressed. When they start pointing to Jesus, when he, they start really honoring God's word, I think demons come close to, to being afraid again. Not for, the same, not for the same reason. Not because they're afraid that this person's gonna get them out, but because now you're on their territory. Now God's word is going out. And God's word never goes out and comes back void. It will always achieve what it's been sent out for. And if we are faithful to preach the gospel, to do what Paul told Timothy and all the people in the, in the back end of the New Testament, preach the word, preach the word, preach the word, preach the word, in season, out of season, preach the word. Anybody who preaches anything other than the gospel that we've delivered to you, he is anathema. Right? Remember all those things? 
Preach the word, preach the word, preach the word. The one true word, the one that we deliver to you once and for all. That's what I think Luke and John or Luke and Mark are getting at. So what would I what would I how would I wrap this up? I got four points. Authentic healing is characteristic of God's perfect, absolute, all inclusive power, not on anything else. If he heals, God at th this type of healing, this authentic healing, miraculous healing, it is complete, total, without uh, uh, delay. It's not this, this, oh, well, you know, you know, two years ago, uh, God healed my husband of uh, cancer. Really? Whoa, wonderful. Praise God. Where is he? Oh, he died a year ago. What did he die of? Cancer. Really? But people, they talk like that. That's, that's that circle because it's, it's separated from God's word. It doesn't connect with the truth of God's word. It's, it's a little euphemism, some little quote something. That's one. Authentic healing always took a supportive role to Jesus' primary purpose of preaching the good news. It was never divorced from the faithful proclamation of God's word. What was Jesus' comment? They wanted him to stay. What did he say? Let's go preach. He says, let's go to a different town. I've come to preach. That's what I was sent for. Doesn't mean he can't do more miracles. It just means my purpose is not to walk around healing the entire world. Or stay there in were one place. Or stay in one place. He did not heal people in other parts of the world. There were people that died. There were people who were sick outside of that place. Well, he, he came to heal them spiritually. That was his main purpose. Yes. His main goal. To heal them spiritually. Right. To give them freedom. To give them, you know, this health. But physical health, it's secondary. I think the physical help proved the spiritual. That Jesus came to, to heal the spiritual sickness. He says, I, I, the, uh, those who are, uh, I have not come for those who are not sick, but I come for those who are sick. Mm -hmm. So the miracles, the healings, pointed and proved that he had the ability to do what he said in the spiritual realm as well. Not just physical. He could do it in the physical. We know he could do it in the physical. We don't pray to God that we, we get healing uh, f as a whim. We, we pray to God because we know he is able, even today. He is able to do it if he, if he chooses. Sometimes he does and sometimes he doesn't. So that's that one. But it's always connected to the Word. And then authentic healing exploded during Jesus' life on earth and the early developmental years of the church, but was rare prior to Christ and rare after Christ's time. Even in church history, as we, we um, if you read some of the, the historians of church history throughout, you know, after the first century, you'll find that they, they stop talking about the gifts. They stop talking about some of the healings. It's not an occurrence anymore. It's not something that they mention anymore. Uh, and lastly, Christ's greatest concern was to preach the good news, and it ought to be our greatest concern also. That we are faithful and stay with the word. That's what we're supposed to do. Yes, Jesus can do miracles. But that's not our primary purpose right now. We're not supposed to go around seeking to heal everybody. And if these faith healers were really true, they could do what Jesus did, you know, the, pound them at the door, pile them in the front door and just do, you know what? Go over to India. Just sit in the middle of, you know, Mother Teresa's little clinic and just heal everybody that's in that area. The millions of people in Calcutta that are, that are... But there's no money in them. Yeah. Well, Anyway, so I, 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 wanted to, I wanted to focus a little bit on that priority and how, does, how do miracles fit? What were their purpose? And uh, hopefully it will help some of us, some people maybe out there, to uh, 
Stick with what's more important. Yes, ma'am. Paul, the apostle, did he not have an infirmity of the flesh? Yes, he did. He was the other one I was going to include, but I figured everybody knew his, his, mm -hmm. his infirmity. And God said, my grace is sufficient. When you are weak, I am strong. Hey, it's not, it's not, he's chucked it up as, amen, yes, Lord, so be it. Let's go preach. Yes, sir. I, I knew a man who has been dead now for a long time, but he had cancer. Mm -hmm. The doctors gave him like two months to live. And he was prayed for, and he was healed. Mm -hmm. And he lived another 15 years. Mm -hmm. And he didn't die of cancer. Mm -hmm. My grandfather is very similar. Uh, went in, f was diagnosed with melanoma all over his body, throughout his body. Went in to go over and a little while, said like six months or whatever it was, lived the whole set family, you know, oh, grandpa's dying a little bit. And then uh, went back in to exploratory surgery or something to find whatever was going on. And it, well, grandpa's comment was is, why are you crying for me? If the Lord wants me to go home, so be it. Praise God, I want to go home. But if the Lord hasn't finished my work or the work he has for me yet, then there isn't anything that's going to keep me from completing that work. Death cannot reign over me in that regard. So stop crying for me. Goes back in and all the melanoma is gone. It's all gone. And he lived probably another 15 or so years after that, didn't he? Yeah. He, he, yeah. At, and, he right. and he died from something totally different. But it's not to say that God doesn't answer prayers for healing. It's not to say that God can't miraculously, instantaneously, all of a sudden, completely and totally heal. It is to say that it is rare that it is not God's method of operation right now to go around where every Christian just touches everybody. I mean, I have had nobody walk in my shadow and, you know, be healed. I don't know if you've had anybody walk under your shadow or whatever, but yes, we are to pray. Yes, we are to put it before the Lord, but it's to God's glory either way. And sometimes we pray, the Lord heals. And sometimes we pray and the Lord doesn't heal. And both are perfect. Both are to God's glory. Some people will tell you that if you, somebody don't get healed, it's from lack of faith. So. Oh, of course. Of course they will. Mm -hmm. Like Paul? Was Paul lacking in faith? I don't think so. Or Timothy, or Trophimus, or Epaphroditus. All what these people. The scripture about whatever <clears throat> condition uh, I'm in, there I should be content. That was, that was Paul. That was Paul also. So, so uh, Pastor Conrad, the gentleman, f the pastor from Africa, has asked people to pray for Africa and to pray that the people who are faithful to the word will be able to have an impact and be able to preach the word and, sp and speak the word. But I, I am more cautious today than I was before about our own culpability as Americans and American Christians and what we allow to get past our borders and what we allow in our churches even at home and should we not be able to say where's that in the Bible that's not what the Bible teaches and we should know it we should be able to say something about it Anyway, let's pray.